Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at the NAD310 audio amplifier. So this amplifier was released in the UK 1995 and sold for approximately £100. And there's quite a number of these amplifiers still out there and from time to time of course they do arrive in the workshop. And overall, you know, not a bad amplifier to work on from a service and repair point of view. And what I would also say is that the audio quality produced by this amp is, is pretty good. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a decent sound quality. So in terms of specifications, so not a high powered amplifier, so it will deliver 20 watts per channel into an 8 ohm speaker load. And frequency response is standard, so that's 20 hertz through to 20 kilohertz. And total harmonic distortion is 0.05%. Uh, it doesn't actually support a moving magnet or moving coil phono input stage and all of them would be regarded as line inputs so your uh, maximum input uh, line voltage would be 210 millivolts and you can connect CD player, uh, video, tuner, tape, auxiliary and it also has on the front as well um, a jack socket where you could plug in maybe an MP3 player I think back in the time they referred to it in the operator manual of connecting a Sony Walkman device. Uh, weight overall is 5 kilograms. Uh, quite a compact amplifier. So height wise 65 millimeters, width 435, and the depth of the amplifier is uh, 250 millimeters. Now, just one point to note with regard to the amp when you look from the front fascia, You've also got a monitor jack on there as well and then you can select the tape input and it's a push button selection and then you can also go tone defeat as well or direct mode as it's often called where you deselect the tone circuits there's also a protection led on the front now i have seen amplifiers come in where the protection led is illuminated but the important point here is that this amplifier doesn't have any form of relay speaker protection system so if you're going to undertake any kind of service work on the amplifier just verify at the rear terminals for the speaker connections just drop your meter on there and check what the DC offset is on okay and you'll find you know it's probably maybe 20 or 30 millivolts thereabouts and that will of course drop once the uh, amplifier is operating but if it's going to be anything higher than that remember that the amplifier is not going to automatically shut down or disconnect your speakers so don't just connect them up and then just make a test and the other thing as well because it's you know an entry-level amplifier there's no headphones jack on this amp all right so again I can't sort of not connect the speakers and then connect the headphones then to just do a, a functional test so most importantly just do a DC offset check on on the rear of the amp so what was the fault with this amplifier well it came in with intermittent loss of sound on the left channel and as the video uh, shows you there are other issues as well which some are age related but also some are directly linked to the design of the amplifier stroke the manufacturer of the amplifier so when I first open it up first thing of course is just to do a visual inspection and you can see that this this brown glue and I've referred to this multiple times both in the tutorial videos and then also in the video backdrops when I do a technical description what had not happened here is this brown glue that they've put onto some of the components just to provide some form of mechanical uh, additional strength hadn't fully dried out so there was still some elasticity to it so it hadn't gone fully conductive or fully corrosive but it's on multiple parts of the amp and what they've done is they put this brown glue around some of the multi ribbon cables where it connects to the tone board so you just got to make some time on that right so just work your way through often I will always tell you just to wear some form of eye protection maybe a plastic scraping tool and just remove all of that brown glue and some of this glue was you know connecting resistor legs it was around a couple of the test points where you measure the um, bias current then for the output transistors so once all of that had then been removed I'm into a phase where I'm just going to start to make some tests. Now, when you just put a small amount of pressure onto the circuit board, the audio on the left channel would return. And I totally understand what has happened. That when I came to remove the plastic fascia, 
you've got to remove the front control knobs and then locate it behind on the bass control treble and the uh, volume control are just locking nuts but the one which was on the main volume control potentiometer it was stripped so what had happened the user had probably maybe moved the volume control thinking that that's actually what the problem was in, and actually wasn't the problem at all and eventually probably tried to tighten it up and then just stripped it so in this case that potentiometer really you know was, was no use anymore okay because you need that washer and then the locking nut held to the front fascia to, fascia to provide that mechanical strength what you can't rely on is that it's loose and you just have the solder pins on the board because that's going to rise you know to, to future so what i've shown in the video and this potentiometer is what we call a biaxial type so it's it's a combined potentiometer and then you have the ability to um, really offset them if you want to um, provide some form of balance control normally they're together the center and the outer spindle and they connect then to the two sets of wipers uh, on each one of the carbon tracks so the potentiometer hadn't failed as such it was just that the, the the main body of it was stripped so i have these in stock and it's a 35 millimeter uh, long shaft but the legs are slightly higher on the ones that i hold in stock um, and this is probably an original oem type design where the manufacturer had you know thousands of these produced uh, for the nad 3 310 so what i have to do is i had to cut off the longer legs and then what I use then are some off cut component leads and I just make a small hook wrap it around and then I can just feed it through the hole on the legs and then just clamp it in position and then it's a case then of soldering each one of those and the gauge wire is reasonably thick it's not, not it's not coming like from a quarter watt resistor you know it's, it's quite substantial and that enabled me then to solder directly into the board nice and flush and it aligned then with the fascia and that was you know a good solid repair and of course the potentiometer isn't stripped so when i came to reassemble i could just lock that into position then so to focus on the issue what i found was and i've seen this problem uh, a number of times before when you remove the front fascia and then you remove all of the screws which are held to the bottom of the case and go through into the heat sink when you look from the top of the board at the left towards the heatsink and as shown in the video there is a screw which just goes through a fibre washer and that connects the heatsink then to the main board the problem here is and it is a bad design you have two very very thin circuit tracks which come from the left channel and then go off to the main part of the amp board and they're literally like hairline cracks that form so when they've done it they've fully tightened it down on a production system and these hairline cracks are there so when you put the pressure on the board that's why you were getting the intermittent loss of sound and what i'm showing and again i've said this in terms of insight before if you have broken tracks don't just rely on scraping off the uh, the coating which covers the copper track and then just flow some solder on there you know solder is not going to give you the mechanical strength that you need so what i do here is i just use some half cut component leads i have them you know in a small bag and solder them directly across the crack okay and it's showing three of them but only two of them are actual circuit tracks the other one is a circuit track but it doesn't connect to anything else then and that provides you with a very good mechanical um, repair with good quality solder and it's not you know, lead free for this amplifier it's 6040 uh, tin lead solder so, uh, sorry lead tin solder and once that was done it's just a case of just using flux remover to, to get rid of all of that now I also show the underside of the board and this is common with the NAD 310 there are different power components and you need to reflow all of the dry jump on the board so don't think that you know there's maybe one or two even for this amp it was pretty much probably five ten minutes where you've just got to reflow the entire board right and that will get rid of any of them and most of them you can see the small cracks around the component leads so once that was all done i also look at the small power supply and what you have on there is just the, rec the bridge rectifiers and the large smoothing capacitors now it is not uncommon 
on the NAD310 to find these have dried out and you may need to replace them and it's dead telltale sign sort of bulging on the top and when you remove them if you sort of give them a shake they completely dry down they, they just literally they rattle but for this amplifier it looked like there'd been some service work that had been carried out some years ago because those um, smoothing capacitors and the same type which you use on the main amp um, board as well when you look at the condition of them they were really good and when I run them through on the uh, ESR meter again well within specification and there wasn't a requirement then to uh, to change them um, I'm also showing the tone control board so when you just sort of take it apart you know just do a complete strip down on it far better than trying to work and, and trying to get access to these so once that was out I could then of course remove the brown glue because it's on both sides of these multi ribbon cables and then what I was also able to do then was just to clean the switches and the potentiometers with uh, deoxid and uh, that just ensured you know noise free operation and then what I'm also showing in the video is the schematic so I show the left channel circuit diagram and this is really old school type of service manual and it's really good because what they've shown you are all, all the different voltages at each of the test points so when you look at the transistors it details what will be the base collector and emitter voltages and then the same also because it has a FET in the output stage again I can see you know the gate and, and, and drain terminals and um, I'm pointing there to a 20 ka potentiometer and that's the volume control um, when you look at it it has four leads on there or four legs now this is very common if it has a loudness switch but this amplifier doesn't have a loudness switch but it is a, uh, a four pin device so you would have the wiper either side of the resistive track and then the fourth one is a tapping off the resistive track and I covered this in the tutorial for the potentiometers and then the final stage here was just to do an overall clean um, there was a lot of dust and dirt for this amplifier which you know is normal because you know the age of the amplifier so just a complete clean sometimes people sort of ask the question you know what do you sort of use in that case well if you just get a long head brush quite stiff brush you can brush out the majority of the dust and dirt and then if you don't have access to a compressed airline you can buy canisters that you use for cleaning keyboards and you can use you know one of those then just to clean it all out and then the final thing was just to just check the um, the bias for each channel no adjustment required and then as I said at the beginning of the tutorial I also check the DC offset and again no issue at all everything was fine and then it was just a case of putting the amplifier then on a functional test and it ran for about two hours in total and after that operational time you know I'm back in there um, just making sure you know there's no increase on the DC offset which there wasn't and that the bias and everything else was was like okay so yeah not a bad repair overall so just to sort of recap if you do get intermittent loss of sound on a NAD310 you may feel that it's the volume control and sometimes it may be but as the video is showing you look at this fixing screw where the heatsink is connecting to the main board it's the one where you have the fiber washer underneath and just check underneath there and in the most cases you'll find that there's small hairline cracks across two of the very very thin circuit tracks and just scrape away the co protective coating access the copper and then put in place then some repair solder links and uh, you should be good to go then all right so that brings us to the end of this tutorial so as always I thank you for uh, stopping by and for listening and uh, until the next time I wish you well thanks very much cheers bye bye